deep beneath the streets of London, there's 150 kilometers of underground train tunnel, which transports millions of commuters every single day. Those of us that live in London mostly just take it for granted or complain about it, but today I'm thankful for it because it's an opportunity to test out this cool new device that I've just received. This is a Radio Code 103, which the guys at Radio Code have very kindly sent me. But beyond that, they're not sponsoring this video, they haven't told me anything to say, and all of this is entirely my opinion. So this little device is a radiation detector and a gamma spectrometer, all in one. And I've wanted one of these for a while, because I've seen some people on YouTube do some pretty cool things with them. Like identifying radioactive isotopes and mapping the background radiation of areas that you travel. So today, I want to see if I can use it to detect radon on the London Underground. Radon is a colourless, odourless radioactive gas which is constantly being released from the earth in very small quantities but over time it can accumulate to dangerous levels in low, poorly ventilated areas like basements for example. Now I want to say up front that I've got no reason to believe that there's a dangerous level of radon on the London Underground. Even though it's very deep underground, there is a lot of air movement as the trains constantly go in and out of the stations and there's air ventilation to allow oxygen to get in. Plus, I'm sure they're probably monitoring things like radon. This video isn't about proving danger because radon is everywhere in low levels anyway. It's just that the London Underground might be quite an interesting place to look for it because being very far underground means that the cosmic radiation which we're bombarded with at the surface won't be able to reach us so there'll be much less radioactive noise in the spectrum. And also, as I say, because it is very far underground, there should be some radon present, even if it's getting moved around. But before we get on the tube, let's talk about what this device can and cannot do. So first off, it's not a Geiger counter. We use the term Geiger counter and radiation detector interchangeably these days, but technically a Geiger counter is a device that has a Geiger-Muller tube, which is full of a low pressure inert gas, so when a charged particle or high energy photon passes through it, it will cause the charge to jump across, registering as a count. So Geiger counters can detect all three of the common types of radiation, alpha, beta and gamma. But classic Geiger counters can't tell you which type they're detecting, it all just gets mushed together as a count. There are more advanced Geiger counters these days, which can do some clever things with energy compensation to differentiate between the types to some extent and they can use that information to also give an estimate for the dose of radiation that's being received, which is very useful. But even these advanced Geiger counters can't differentiate between different radioactive isotopes and tell you what you're detecting. So that's where this comes in. So rather than a Geiger tube, the radio code uses a scintillation detector. It's basically a small crystal, which is very sensitive to gamma radiation. It uses a photomultiplier to amplify the signal so you get a much higher count rate on this than you would from a generic Geiger counter. But the most interesting part is that when the gamma photon hits the crystal, it registers how much energy the gamma photon had. And this is a really important piece of data because the energy of a gamma photon that's been emitted by a radioactive source is dependent on which source it was emitted from. In simpler terms, when an atom decays, it will always emit gamma photons of the same energy. That's not to say it can only emit one energy. Multiple of these decays emit you know, two, three, four different energy photons, but those two, three, four energies will always be the same. So if you can get a spectrum of all of the energies of the gamma photons that you're detecting, it's kind of like a fingerprint of the isotope. So that's the trade-off. Geiger counters can detect alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, but they can't give you much more information than there's something radioactive here. Whereas the radio code can only pick up gamma radiation, but it's incredibly sensitive to it and it gives you a ton of information with it. Now, not being able to detect alpha and beta radiation might sound like a significant drawback, but it's not as bad as you'd think, and I'll tell you why. If you look at the decay paths of some of these common isotopes that people are collecting, like uranium or thorium, you'll see it's pretty much just alpha and beta decay which might make you think that the radio code is going to be useless at detecting these sort of isotopes. Except that's not really the case, because what these diagrams don't show is that although the isotope might decay by alpha radiation, say, the newly formed daughter isotope is probably going to be in a high energy state, and it has to relax down into its new ground state, which involves releasing the excess energy as a gamma ray photon. A lot of these diagrams don't include it for simplicity, but 
in actual fact, a lot of these decays do actually produce gamma radiation as well. Not all of them, but enough that the radio code can actually be quite a useful tool for detecting a lot of these radioactive isotopes. And because the radio code is quite sensitive, there's a good chance that even if the isotope you're looking for doesn't emit any gamma radiation, one of the daughter products will. So if you can find evidence of isotopes further down in the decay chain, then you can infer that your original isotope is probably there as well. So let's get into some testing. We'll start with this thorium mantle because it's a nice strong source. I'm using an Android phone for a couple of reasons. Number one, the Radio Code app on Android has several features that haven't been released on iOS yet, but it looks like they are regularly releasing updates for it, so it'll probably catch up soon. And number two, I film on my iPhone, so I had to use this spare phone. So to take a spectrum, I'll put the Radio Code on the source, uh, acknowledge the alarm that's telling me that it is indeed radioactive, and I'll reset the spectrum collection on the app. And you can see already it started to collect data. The higher the activity of the source, the faster you'll get a decent spectrum. Uh, of course, leaving it for longer is always better, but for something decently radioactive like this, you'd probably be able to identify it within five, 10 minutes, depending on if you already know what you're looking for. If you're not in a rush and you want to get a really nice spectrum, you can leave it for eight, 12, 24 hours and get a really nice spectrum. The battery life is 300 hours continuous, so you can easily run it for that sort of time. Uh, maybe use a spare phone so you don't leave the room and disconnect it. But I think even if you do disconnect, once it reconnects later, it will just transfer the data over. So directly, yeah, you don't even need to have your phone nearby. So it's been running for about five minutes and we can already see some definite peaks forming, which if we hover over them, we can see they correspond to thorium decay. The guys at Radio Code also sent me some dried mushrooms from somewhere that was affected by the Chernobyl fallout. They're only slightly radioactive. They're reading about double my local background radiation, but they're still plenty radioactive enough for us to try and get a spectrum. So I took a spectrum of the mushrooms and now I'm gonna apply a 16 hour background that I took in my room earlier. This feature of applying backgrounds isn't available on the iOS app at the time of recording, but what we can do is that once we've applied the background, we can subtract it from our spectrum, which will remove all of this noise, which was in both spectrums and just leave us with the difference between. So this should hopefully isolate the peaks that we're looking for. We're looking for cesium-137, which is a reasonably long-lived decay product of uranium-238 fission. It doesn't really appear in nature, so if we can detect it, it's pretty good proof that these mushrooms are radioactive due directly to the uranium fuel from the Chernobyl nuclear accident. So if we hover over this peak, you can see it says cesium-137, and it's also highlighting the positions where we'd expect the other peaks to be, if it is indeed cesium, and we can see that each of those positions does also have a peak, so we can be pretty confident that it is cesium that we're detecting. You might notice that some of the peaks at the higher energies don't exactly line up to the lines. And this is because of the calibration of the device. It's calibrated so most of the peaks which are, appear in the lower energy region are gonna be perfectly aligned. You can recalibrate it to the higher energy lines, but then it's gonna be slightly askew for the lower lines. It's a bit of a balancing act, but it's a limitation of the device that it can't have everything in the whole spectrum being perfectly aligned at the same time. But as long as you know that's the case, it's still pretty easy to see when the peaks are present. You've just got to account for that slight drift. So now we know how to use the device, let's get onto radon. So the first question is, can the radio code actually detect it? And the short answer is not directly. Once radon gas is emitted from the isotopes in the ground, it decays into polonium-218 via alpha decay within a matter of days. And within a few minutes after that, it decays into lead-214. Neither of these alpha decays actually give out any gamma radiation, which isn't ideal, but in quick succession, the lead-214 decays via beta radiation to bismuth-214 and then to polonium-210, and both these decays actually do give out strong gamma signals. So even though that's a way down the decay chain, once the radon decays, it all happens within a few hours. To get an accurate count for radon levels, you'd have to use a commercial radon detector, which directly detect the alpha particles from radon decay. 
over a few days or weeks to get an accurate idea of how much radon builds up in that area. We won't be able to get quantitative data on radon levels because the radio code isn't a radon detector, it's not its job, it's not calibrated for it. All I'm hoping to see is if it's sensitive enough that we can actually detect the presence of radon in certain places on the underground. Radon is the first daughter product of the radium decay chain, so we can use these radium painted watch handles to see if we can detect all of the daughter products we were talking about. The half-life of radium is 1600 years, so there's only going to be a very small amount of radon and the other decay products in this little case here, but we should still be able to see their presence. So I'll take a spectrum as before. These peaks here are from lead 214 decay, and these peaks are from bismuth 214 decay. We can ignore this big peak due to radium itself, because that's obviously not going to be present when we're actually looking for radon. On this screen we've got quite a nice interface for count rate and dose rate, but I don't think they're going to be particularly useful for this application, because the radon is going to be quite low level, it's not going to be obvious when we're seeing it. But this third graph here, hardness, could actually be quite useful. I think this is quite a new addition to the app. I don't know exactly what formula they're using, but the hardness is basically the dose rate divided by the count rate. So essentially it's taking the total energy that's hit the detector in a second, divided by the number of collisions in that second, to give the average energy of each collision. And as we talked about earlier, the energy of the photon depends on what isotope it came from. So if we see a peak in a specific region, the hardness can be a sort of rough way of identifying sources quickly. Using the spectrum is much more reliable and concrete, but this can be a good first step. To demonstrate, you can see that if I hold the detector over the thorium mantle, the hardness is peaking at this point, and the radio code is suggesting that that might be thorium. The radio code has the hardness region between 2.8 and 3.06 labelled as radium, but of course we know that if we see that peak out in the field, it's probably not radium, it's radon. Because of course the hardness isn't just based on radon, but it's also based on all the daughter products that we were talking about, which are shared between radon and radium. So as I said, the hardness feature on its own is quite rough, but if I turn on the spectrogram feature as well, which basically takes a snapshot spectrum every few seconds, then we'll be able to track it. Then if we see something interesting happening on the hardness spectrum, we can check the corresponding timestamp on the spectrogram look at that spectrum and see if we can see anything interesting on there to get a better idea of exactly what was going on. I tried to plan a route that would go through a lot of the deepest stations. I'm going to start at Walthamstow Central and take the Victoria line all the way down to Brixton. Then I'll get a Northern Line train up to Archway before turning around and getting off at Hampstead because it's the deepest underground station. I'll travel up to the surface, walk around a bit, come back down, see if we get any interesting data and then I'm just going to head back towards Walthamstow via King's Cross. I'll turn on the mapping feature on the app, but obviously GPS won't be able to track me underground, so we'll just be able to see where I surface. As the GPS won't work, I'm going to manually note down the times that I reach each station, so we can match it up to the timestamps of the spectrum later on. So I got the radio code set up, and I put it around my ankle, because I figured if there's any radon present, it might be nearer to the ground, because it's a dense gas. I got the train at Walthamstow and the journey went pretty much to plan. I travelled down the Victoria line where a lot of the stations are at least 20 metres deep. Then the Northern line which is also quite deep. Especially Hampstead. The station's not much further down than the others but it's on a hill so it is technically much deeper underground than the others. I got out of Hampstead and went up the elevator and walked around the surface for 10 minutes and then came back down. Then I started the return journey and I ended up surfacing at King's Cross just to have a get a coffee and had a look around, sort of platform nine and three quarters and the Harry Potter shop. And then I got back to Walthamstow without issue. So now onto the interesting bit, analyzing the data, see if we actually got anything. First off, the overall count rate did reduce significantly whenever I went into the underground, which, as we predicted, is because the cosmic radiation from the sun and other cosmic sources can't penetrate that far through the ground, so we avoid all that noise in the spectrum. I layered the count rate, dose rate, and hardness graphs together, and then I plotted the stations on the chart by cross-referencing the timestamps with my notes. 
I set the line on the hardness graph to show where we're expecting to see peaks that correspond to radon. And I saw that there are actually peaks in that region and they're not random. They seem to be when I exit a station and then when I enter it again. Like you can see when I ascended and descended at Hampstead and King's Cross and when I ascended at the end at Walthamstow. Interestingly, there's no noticeable peaks where I just got off a train, walked to the other platform and then got on another train, which implies to me that the radon's not being detected directly when you get off the train, because as I said, there's a lot of airflow on the direct station, but somewhere between the surface and the platform, where I guess you're outside of the direct wind tunnel effect that the trains cause, there's a point where we seem to have detected radon, which is pretty interesting. But as I said earlier, to be more confident with these results, I'm going to check the spectrogram at the timestamps of these interesting peaks. Now, as this spectrum is just a snapshot from the spectrogram, it's obviously not going to be particularly well defined. But if we look here, we can definitely see there's the lead 214 peaks and bismuth 214 as well. So it does look like we've managed to detect radon, which I'm pretty impressed with because it was definitely not ideal conditions. We were out on the move the whole time and the radon's very low concentration. So I'm pretty impressed with the features and the sensitivity of the radio code. For reference, here's the chart of 12 hours of data collection, just me walking about my house. Just so you can see that even though the count, dose rate, hardness does jump about slightly, we don't get random peaks and the hardness like we're seeing in the underground data. Let's take a look at the surface mapping just for interest. So you can see the areas that I surfaced, Walthamstow, not particularly interesting radiation wise, but you can see at King's Cross, there was a bit of a difference in the radiation level. I mean, it maxed out at 7.7 .7 counts per second, which is still well within normal background. So it's not really much of a jump, but that area definitely seems to be higher than the others. Um, I wasn't paying attention to it at the time, so I didn't look for any reason why that might be the case. It could have just been that most of it was inside the station, which is somewhat blocked from the cosmic radiation, whereas I might have gone outside or been by a window in that area. But I look forward to tracking some longer walks and hikes and stuff, especially in areas with some interesting geology, quarries, stuff like that. I really like the look of this chart with all the stations mapped on it. So I think I might print it out as a poster and I've uploaded a high resolution version of it in the link in the description if you want to have a closer look or print it out yourself or anything. I've got some more plans for the radio code I want to try out in the future. I want to do some X-ray fluorescence of elements once I get an americium source. I also want to try and get some spectrums of some of my weaker sources like my trinitite sample, which is very, very weak. But hopefully if I put it in a lead lined container and took a spectrum over a few days, see if we can see some of the characteristic isotopes of trinitite and sort of prove that this is a authentic sample. I mean, I don't have any doubts that it is. I bought it from a reputable seller, but be cool to be able to verify it yourself with a small little device like this, rather than having to send it off to a gamma spectrometry lab to get confirmation. So anyway, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.